Okay, welcome to our discussion of how neurons send electrical signals from chapter 48. We're going to first talk about how uh, the neuron is set up structurally, uh, so some different parts of a neuron cell. Um, there are going to be uh, regions called the dendrites over here. Um, dendrites um, kind of look like little tree branches, that's why we call them that. Um, and generally the dendrites are going to be where signals are received um, by a neuron. Um, you can broadly think of there as being different types of neurons, maybe sensory neurons, interneurons that sort of make up the neurons of your brain that are constantly getting signals from the sensory neurons around the body. And then sometimes those interneurons can talk to other interneurons, um, and then those inter some interneurons might send signals to motor neurons. Motor neurons are just connected to muscles so that we can maybe issue a command to respond by moving in some way based upon what we're sensing. So you've got dendrites of any neuron um, that maybe receive information. Um, for the sensory neurons, it'd be whatever they're set up to detect. For an interneuron or a motor neuron, they'd be receiving signals from the previous neuron, um, which I'll show in just a minute. Um, we've got the cell body. So any neuron's got to have a region where the nucleus is um, that makes all the proteins um, and all the, has all, all the organelles in it. Um, and then there's going to be kind of this long slender region um, that's called the axon um, that's going to send the electrical signal that it generates onto the next neuron, say. Um, so the axon would actually be this little part kind of underneath and purple here. Um, the axon looks wrapped with this yellow substance. That yellow substance also has a name. Um, it's called myelin. Um, myelin is kind of a mix of substances, mostly fats. Um, and the idea here is by wrapping it around the axon, we're actually insulating the electrical signal so that it travels down the axon faster. Um, it doesn't fully cover the axon. There are actually little parts where we need the electrical signal to kind of be regenerated from the outside. Um, but it's wrapped around most of it so that the electrical signal proceeds smoothly through it. Um, think of it as sort of like the um, rubber wrapped around an electrical cord. Um, for example. Um, that myelin is actually created by a cell that wraps itself around the axon. So these are actually functional cells themselves. Um, so you could say that the Schwann cell is the name of the cell um, that produces the myelin that sort of is wrapped around the axon. Um, so they're actually support cells around neurons, um, and Schwann cells are just one example of them. Um, so those are some basic regions uh, of a neuron structure. Um, if we were to think about one neuron getting uh, connecting and communicating with the next neuron, uh, maybe this is a sensory neuron over here that's reporting to an interneuron in the brain, for example. Um, they would get very close to each other. The axon of the first neuron would get very close to, say, the dendrites of the next neuron, but they don't actually touch. There's a little bit of a space in between them, and that space has a name and is very important. Um, that little gap in between them is called a synapse. Sometimes it's called the synaptic gap. Sometimes it's called the synaptic cleft. Um, I'm fine with just synapse. Um, and that's a really important region where they talk to each other. Um, the electrical signal actually comes down the first neuron and eventually causes it to release little tiny chemicals that travel across the gap and maybe get the next neuron to fire in response. Um, and those little chemicals also have a name. Um, we call those neurotransmitters. Um, if you've heard of things like serotonin and dopamine and GABA and, and things like that, those are actually examples of neurotransmitters. I'm not going to talk very much about neurotransmitters in this particular video. I may, might make another video or might just talk in class about neurotransmitters and synapses. Um, they're really important to understanding how the brain works. Um, but I'm just going to focus my attention on one sample neuron today and talking about how it fires an electrical signal. So let's get to electrical signaling. Um, what is electricity again? Electricity, as we saw in respiration and photosynthesis, is nothing more than the movement of particles with charge. Uh, back then, it happened to be H pluses um, flowing through ATP synthase. We're going to see that Na plus sodium and K plus potassium um, are both involved here in neurons, uh, but the principle is still the same. 
So we're going to see that in order to fire an electrical signal, you've got to create the conditions for them to move. Um, and we're going to call that resting potential. So we're going to investigate that first. How do we get set up to fire the electrical signal? And then we're going to see what actually happens when the neuron is triggered to fire that signal. Um, and we call that signal an action potential. So um, this is kind of a characteristic action potential. Um, what we're asking you to imagine here on the graph is that uh, you have time on the x-axis. And notice that time is in milliseconds because uh, these signals occur very quickly. Um, and the y-axis is voltage. Um, and what we're really thinking of here is it's the voltage inside of a cell, inside the neuron, um, as compared to the outside of it. Um, and so we're going to see that we're always thinking about what it's like inside the neuron for this graph. And we're going to walk through this whole graph kind of one step at a time. Um, so we're going to talk about it here in just a second. Um, before we do that, let's just think about how action potentials convey information. Um, and so I just want you to appreciate very broadly that uh, neurons encode information in the frequency that they send action potentials down their axons. Uh, so recall what frequency is. Frequency is just how often or how, how much APs occur per unit time in this example. Um, so a neuron um, can send information by how often it sends action potentials. Um, so just as a quick example, maybe there's a sensory neuron in our body, maybe in our hand, in our fingers, um, that detect temperature. Um, that could be really important because if you touch something hot, you're going to want to move your hand, right? Um, so maybe that sensory neuron is always sending signals. It's just sending signals at different frequencies based upon what temperature it is. Maybe this is the frequency frequency that it sends signals to the brain at room temperature. Uh, maybe if it detects a much hotter temperature, it speeds up the action potential rate. Um, so it sends action potentials much more frequently. Um, the brain will actually detect that increased frequency as meaning, whoop, it's hot down there by the fingers from that neuron. Um, and maybe if it's really cold, it really slows down its action potential frequency. Um, that too conveys information. That is useful information for the brain as well. So um, uh, the key idea is that uh, neurons send information the same way. The action potential looks the same for any neuron. Um, but whatever the neuron is set up to detect, it's going to convey that information as a certain frequency of action potential transmission. So once again, how do you send a signal? Um, so we're going to walk through this step by step. Um, you first got to prepare. So we're going to talk about the region down here early on. Um, and we see that the inside of the neuron, it's very negative overall. Um, and we're going to have to justify kind of how it's set up at rest before you fire. So um, this is going to be the um, illustration that I use kind of throughout this little video presentation. Um, I've got a cell membrane. Um, you can see that I'm depicting the bottom part here is pretending to be like inside the cell. So here's the cytoplasm. Um, and maybe um, here is the region just outside the neuron. Um, so outside of its cell membrane. Um, here's its cell membrane here with a phospholipid bilayer and various proteins embedded within it. Um, I've kind of created three color-coded proteins here. I've got um, a sodium channel here on the left. Um, this guy could potentially let sodium ions through it. Um, but we're going to see at rest that it is closed. Um, so I'm just going to draw little red lines like that to indicate that it's closed. Um, this um, uh, red one here is a, is a potassium channel that could potentially let potassium ions flow through it. Um, but it's also closed at rest. So the only type of protein that we're going to talk about that's open is um, this third protein here. Um, this third protein here is called the sodium potassium pump. Um, because what it does is it pumps sodium and potassium ions, actually both, um, and it's going to pump them so it's going to actively transport them. It's going to concentrate both of them on one side of the membrane. 
And so what it actually does, I'm going to briefly show some movement here. I'm going to show the blue squares moving out, or sodium moving out of the cell, and it's at the same time going to pump potassium into the cell. Um, so by this m means of active transport, remember that active transport requires energy, ATP, um, so I showed a little starburst there. Um, so they're constantly spending energy making sure that potassium is very concentrated inside and that sodium is very concentrated outside. Those are the conditions that we require to eventually send an action potential. So here's my summary of that. Um, this is going to lead to an overall negative uh, potential inside of the neuron compared to the outside. That might seem a little strange because you might say, well, aren't we concentrating a positive ion inside the neuron, potassium? Um, and that is true. Um, however, I'm going to try and make this very simple for this course. Um, I just want you to imagine that there's lots of DNA and proteins inside cells, which is true. Um, and that in many cases there are regions of those proteins that are negative and um, DNA itself is extremely negative. Remember that DNA is made of a sugar phosphate backbone and that phosphates are very negative in charge. Um, and so I'm just going to oversimplify and I'm going to say uh, imagine that all of those things make the inside much more negative than the outside region. Okay, there's a more complicated explanation for why the inside is negative, but I'm not going to go through that in this course. So here we are. We're at resting conditions. We're ready to fire, um, and we're kind of negative inside the cell at rest. So um, now that we're ready to think about sending the signal, we're going to break this up into a few parts. We're going to see that there's this spike of, of positivity that is generated inside the cell. And then the inside of the cell um, kind of very quickly becomes negative again. And then we get back to rest. Those are kind of the three stages that we're briefly going to talk about. Let's talk about why the cell becomes very positive inside suddenly. So that happens because there is some kind of stimulus. Remember how I said the um, potassium channels and the sodium channels were closed initially? Well, what's going to happen is whatever stimulus a, uh, that neuron is set up to detect, that stimulus itself will open sodium channels first. So sodium channels are suddenly open for business. Um, sodium ions will like to rush through them. Um, and they really got two reasons that they want to do that. Um, they want to rush down their concentration gradient, so they are going to go through facilitated diffusion from high to low concentration. The other reason they want to move into the cell is that it's negative inside the cell um, relative to the outside. So positive ions are going to be kind of repelled by the positivity outside and attracted to the negativity inside. So this is, um, you could say that uh, sodium ions are rushing down their electrochemical gradient. They've really got two reasons to want to come in. And now they finally can come in because these sodium channels are finally open, triggered by the stimulus of what a neuron detects. So I just showed a bunch of um, blue um, sodium ions rushing in. They should be rushing in through the sodium channel. Uh, why does this make the inside of the cell more positive? Because sodium ions are positive. So when some of them rush in, um, that's going to cause the inside of the cell to actually become more positive temporarily than the outside of the cell. Um, we've actually switched positive and negative. So here's my summary of that. Some kind of stimulus causes the sodium channels to open. Um, that could be the thing that the sensory neuron detects, the temperature or the chemical. Um, uh, your taste buds have sensory neurons, and when that chemical um, reaches their cell membranes, that's what causes the sodium channels to open. For an interneuron or for a motor neuron, it would just be the neurotransmitter that might cause sodium channels to open. Sodium rushes in, and the inside becomes temporarily positive. OK, so milliseconds later, step two, uh, the inside of the cell is going to very quickly become very negative again compared to the outside. So why? Uh, because sodium channels are going to uh, be open at first to cause sodium to rush in, but now they're going to close again milliseconds later that, that uh, positivity inside the cell is actually going to close them. 
And that positivity, positivity closes them, but actually opens now the potassium channels for business. So now the potassium can finally diffuse, and it's going to want to diffuse for two reasons. Number one, it wants to go from high to low chemical concentration through diffusion. And number two, it's now kind of negative outside relative to the inside. And so those positive ions now actually want to rush down their electric gradient as much as their chemical gradient. So potassium rushes out like crazy. So I'm showing some um, potassium ions moving. Not all of them move, but plenty enough move. And if positive ions leave the cell in mass, then that would make the inside more negative again relative to the outside. So um, here's my summary of that once again. Sodium channels now close. Potassium channels open for a few milliseconds. And the, those, that's enough time for the potassium ions to rush out through facilitated diffusion passive transport here in an action potential. That's going to make the inside very negative. So um, I just want you to imagine that that signal, that, that temporary positivity and that temporary negativity, that quick spike of positive and negative, um, travels all the way through the neuron. Here is my uh, very cheesy way of trying to show that. Um, it spreads perhaps from the dendrites to the cell body, and then that um, positive and negative um, goes down the axon. Why does it do that? Because if you imagine an area of the axon has its sodium channels open, and sodium starts rushing into one area, it's actually that sodium rushing in that might cause sodium channels next door to open and now the sodium rushes in there and the potassium rushes out and then that might cause the next region a little further down their sodium channels open so sodium can rush in there and potassium can rush out so it's this just constant travel of the action potential down the axon um, due to all of these um, channels opening and closing and I'll show you that through a video in class um, it's much easier to see with a, a video that's slightly better than what I'm capable of here. All right, so our last step is then just to restore resting conditions. So we are actually a little bit more negative than we were at rest, and we've just got to reset the ions so that we can send another electrical signal. So what does that? That's the sodium-potassium pump again. Uh, the sodium channels were already closed from before. Um, and now that it's like super negative inside the cell again, that's going to cause the potassium channels to close once again. So these guys are kind of temporarily closed for business because we're trying to reset resting conditions. And now these sodium potassium pumps can go to work and push the sodiums back out and pull the potassiums back in. And just remember that's going to involve active transport, that's going to involve ATP. So we're sort of using effort and energy to reset the conditions, and then perhaps if stimulated again, the cell can fire another action potential through facilitated diffusion. Um, so here's my summary of that step. The sodium potassium pump is um, back to work actively transporting. This is, by the way, why neurons use so much ATP and so much energy, um, because they're constantly doing active transport to reset conditions so that they can fire again. Um, and basically, your neurons are almost always firing at some frequency. OK. So that's my attempt to summarize um, nerve transmission, how nerves send electrical signals. This is really just a signaling pathway. Um, some kind of stimulus comes in and opens sodium channels so that sodium can rush in first, then potassium rushes out, and that's kind of the two stages of sending a quick electric signal.